So how, hello and welcome to our Ask the Expert live webinar this evening. We have 76 people registered for this event and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the event tonight. My name is Paula Hanford, I'm the CEO of PSC Support and I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Dr. James Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson is a transplant hepatologist from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. He is also the clinical lead for IQUILS, which is improving quality in liver services. Uh, so he's very well qualified to take your questions this evening. As always, I'm sure you will join me in thanking Dr. Ferguson for giving up his time completely free of charge tonight when he could be putting his children to bed and he's just popped up to say goodnight to them before he jumps on. Um, and the title of this session is Waiting for a Liver Transplant? Question mark. And this is for everyone who would like to ask a question. It's a question and answer session. There are always lots of questions on this topic. Uh, it's obviously a very important one for people living with PSC. We are going to go straight into questions this evening. So do please put them in the chat section and we'll, we'll come to hopefully every single question that we have. As always on these sorts of events, Dr. Ferguson cannot answer individual med, you know, individual, cannot give individual medical advice, but he will answer the questions in the best possible way that he can. So without further, further ado, welcome, uh, Dr. Ferguson. Thank you so much for giving up your time this evening. Um, and I have a couple of questions to start us off. So how long does a typical uh, transplant operation take? Um, okay. I guess there's probably no such thing as a typical one. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't do them. I'm not, obviously I'm not a surgeon. And I think it, it, it all depends. Um, yeah. But on average, between five to eight hours, liver transplant surgery can take. It is a complex surgery. Often the most complex part is, is actually taking the um, original organ out safely. Mm -hmm. And then obviously um, putting the organ in is making sure that happens in a timely manner, uh, given that it's been out of the body for a certain length of time. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. And what, what are the criteria for being listed um, for a transplant? For people with PSC? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, this is, a, it, 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 this is hard because I, mean, I think I, I spend a lot of my time in the clinic, the PSC clinic, thinking about this and talking, obviously, with my patients about this, about when is the right time to refer. I think the first thing is always to think about it earlier rather than later. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about reasons for referring for liver transplantation. So I, you know, I always will think about referring people early uh, and timing for referral in, in patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis can be difficult because of the unpredictable nature of the disease. But the things that make me concerned and make me start to think about uh, a, a, a referral uh, for a transplanter if a patient develops signs of liver failure firstly so if they develop ascites I think it's worrying if someone has varices that's not an indication in itself but it's a concern and that someone's starting to get close to that point if they develop encephalopathy so that's the confusion related to mm -hmm. liver failure if they're starting if they've if they've got some of these things signs of liver failure and they've lost a lot of weight um, so they're what we call sarcopenic and then they're, so they're quite general indications but then there are more specific ones with with PSC so that can be recurrent episodes of biliary infection or, or it's called cholangitis um, if someone is persistently very jaundiced in PSC and that's not settling that can be a concern uh, and make us think about it so broadly they're the indications but but as I said at the beginning of my answer, it's important that we refer early because of the unpredictable nature of PSC. And it can be hard to pick that time that is the right time to put on the transplant waiting list. Yeah. Okay. Just in terms of the assessment process then, can you, can you talk us through the 
the process for assessment? Yeah. So I, I, it will be a bit different in the, in the there are seven transplant centres in the in the UK, yeah. and it, it'll be slightly different in each centre. But I'll describe what happens in our centre, and I and I also trained up in Edinburgh, so I know perhaps what happens up there as well. So, firstly, a clinician will refer to a transplant unit saying that they think that this person may meet criteria for transplantation. Um, so then that patient will go into an assessment process. Now that can be done as an outpatient or an inpatient. Some centres do primarily their assessments mainly on the ward as an inpatient, some do as outpatients. For example, in Birmingham, we do the majority, maybe 75 to 80 percent of our patients as as outpatients. And and it, you really you only go through the process in inpatients if you're sicker and not well enough to do it as an outpatient. Mm -hmm. Firstly, you come up um, for a huge number of tests and those tests are to one gauge how significant your liver disease is to image your liver. So that will be with an ultrasound and a CT to get an idea of the vasculature, if there are any, any concerns that might come up from that. There'll be tests to check on um, uh, your cardiovascular fitness, so an echocardiogram, an ECG. Uh, we might sometimes do more in-depth studies um, for um, looking for ischemic heart disease in particular people who are particularly at risk. We look at tests to check on respiratory function, so primary function tests, chest x-ray. We do a whole gamut of blood tests. So we do all those tests and we look through them and see if anything has um, in particular come up. And then we will go, the, the, the patient who's going through the assessment will come up with their relatives and they'll meet all the team. And, the, and that part of the process is uh, partly us getting to know the patient but the patient and their family getting to understand about transplantation and everything that happens about transplantation. So there's a big educational part around that. Um, so that often takes a couple of days. You'll meet a uh, surgeon, anaesthetist, physician, dietitians, uh, our transplant coordinators, uh, and the patient and their family will learn huge amounts about transplantation and will learn lots about that family. And then finally, we will have an MDT. And then an MDT stands for a multidisciplinary team meeting. So all the members of the team will be there. And um, broadly, we're trying to answer two questions. So firstly, is there the need for transplantation? Is this the right time to put someone on the transplant waiting list? And you know, do those meet those indications I was talking about? And I can talk a little bit more in detail about we are governed by certain criteria from NHS blood and transplant around that. And then is, are there any contraindications to transplantation? Uh, for example, have we found out uh, heart disease that we didn't expect or um, uh, respiratory problems or, or, or perhaps a, a malignancy like a cancer? Um, so then if we all agree, that this patient meets indications and there are no contraindications, then we will offer listing to that patient and then they will go on the transplant waiting list. So hopefully that answers the question about um, assessment. One, so we've, we've answered criteria for being listed for transplant and maybe just to go into that in a little bit more detail, we, we do have, um, we are governed by certain criteria from NHSBT. So there are certain minimal listing criteria. So you have to be sick enough um, and you have to meet certain criteria that are on the minimal list criteria, but I've kind of gone through those. So the next question is, my daughter is 18 years old and has PSC. She sometimes drinks alcohol. How dangerous is it for her? Okay, well, we get asked that a lot, and I think that's come up in other Q&As about consuming alcohol in the context of liver disease. I think the first thing to say is it depends on how advanced a patient's liver disease is. So I think if, they, if a patient has significant scarring or what we would call cirrhosis of the liver, generally we, advo we advise patients to avoid drinking alcohol. Um, however, if someone has liver disease but not such advanced fibrosis, 
Uh, and, you know, patient is, is, is 18 years old, often they will want to drink the occasional uh, glass of alcohol. And I think that's fine. You know, people have to live their lives. I often advise that they, they just try and be much more sensible than their friends, that they're open and honest with their friends so they, they don't have any peer pressure. But I, I don't think the occasional glass in someone who hasn't got significant scarring is, is, is something that is, is dangerous. Okay, um, next question. Is there a particular order in which the case by case of the list is determined? Um, I think, I think what you're asking, and maybe, you know, maybe if I don't answer this properly, do, do uh, ask again, Chris, is, is um, how do we, how are organs potentially allocated? Um, so that's a complicated process. So I think the first thing that we have to decide, and we decide that, we as a group decide what organs might be suitable for a patient, depending on how sick they are. Um, now, you may or may not be aware that there are two ways of donating. There's um, donation after brain death, which is probably the more common way of donating. So that's when a clinician has, um, has two or a number of clinicians have decided that a patient is, is, is brain dead and then the team can go out and uh, harvest the organs. And then the other method is donation after cardiac death. Um, and that is when you have to wait for the uh, heart to stop. Uh, and that means that the organ is potentially not such a good, well, the potentially slightly more risk associated with that. So we will just make decisions about what we think is safe. And then we'll also obtain consent from patients for what they, what type of organs they would want to receive. And then once you're on the waiting list, there is a system, uh, there's a national allocation system for, for uh, organs that have been obtained from donation after brain death. And we take a number of variables from the patient um, and variables from the organ that has been offered up and the, a computer algorithm works out what is the best outcome with that organ and the patient in the country, and it will go to that patient first. They also have to, they, they also have to be matched by blood group as well. Um, so that's how organs are allocated um, within, within the UK. So I think that's hopefully what I was saying, and then how long you could wait, I think you also mentioned. So it's very variable how pe long people wait. I think if the patient's very sick, they should be transplanted quickly because it's not about how long you wait, it's about how sick you are. But also some people can wait on the list for, for, for up to two years. Generally what we find is patients are either transplanted very quickly or wait quite a long time. Okay, so hopefully that answers the question. I'll keep going down. Okay, so. If you are diagnosed when you are 17 years old, how long can you survive without a transplant? Um, okay, so we often get asked, you know, what's going to happen? Can you predict? Obviously we can talk about averages, but I think it, it, it really does depend. It depends on how to severe your disease is, what type of problems are you running into? But we can, we can talk in probabilities, we, we can, when we see someone's PSC, we can look at it, we can stage their disease, and we can say what the likelihood is over the next five years of needing a transplant. Um, the next question is, what is the average success rate of PSC liver transplants? And what is the definition of successful transplantation? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question. And, and, and the, the caveat is also reasonable. So I guess, we, we define success as someone being alive. Um, but I, what I would say is the reason I went into transplantation is that it is a remarkable procedure and really leads to a huge improvement of people's quality of life. Um, so if we take a 100 patients who are transplanted for PSC and uh, we go to five years later, 
probably 89 of them will be still alive. So that's about almost about 90% alive at five years. Um, so that's the average success rate. So the main concerns about why people might run into problems, um, I think our main concern uh, continues to be recurrent PSC coming back in the liver graft. Okay, I will keep moving through the questions. Um, so then I think, um, Camille, you've asked about the current research landscape. I might, I th might stick to the more transplanty ones and then if, 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 if I've got time, come back to that one, if that's okay. So John, you're asking, what are the main complications experienced post-operatively? Um, okay, so I think it, if we talk about the first three months and what, what type of complications might people run into, they, they run into to broadly a, a few categories. So firstly, it's not uncommon to run into problems with rejection. So that's when the body's immune system tries to reject the liver. Um, we treat a number of people with, for rejection after transplantation. Uh, often we do that very successfully, um, and that's just often by uh, perhaps increasing immunosuppressive uh, drugs or uh, giving sort of stronger doses for a significant length of time. Um, other problems people might run into, uh, people might run into usual post-surgical problems, so they might have a bit of bleeding, um, there might be problems with the joints that have been made. Um, so sometimes the biliary joint that we make uh, is a little bit tight and that needs to be operated upon. Sometimes the blood vessels that are, that are joined together, there might be issues with them. Um, people might run into issues when they're on intensive care uh, with, with uh, things like chest infections. Um, and people can run into infective problems as well. Uh, obviously, you've had a large operation, we're giving you anti-rejection drugs and you're more at risk of infections. So there's some of the common complications. The, another one that commonly happens is people's kidneys sometimes fail. About 30% of patients run into significant problems with their kidneys because they've had a big operation and some of the drugs we give lead to that, but that normally resolves. So, so yeah, I mean, it, I often say to people that... Um, that, you know, there are, there are often a number of problems uh, post-operatively, but, but I guess that's what we do and, and we make sure we get people through those difficult speed bumps. Okay, so I'll move on. Here we are. So uh, do, you, do I believe that better mental health should be given to patients undergoing uh, transplantation, uh, waiting after it? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so I've obviously referred lots of people. I've looked after lots of people during transplantation and after transplantation, and I can only imagine how hard that is to go through. Um, we would really like to have a lot better psychological input uh, for both people waiting and for people after transplantation. And and, and I've put in a number of business cases to try and get psychological support, but many of you will be aware that, that the mental health side of the NHS has been eroded away over the years and, and, and it is, is pretty inadequate, but we would like that. And we're, we're really pushing hard to try and get better safe psychological support. So yes, I very much agree that that's something that we, we, we could do better and we could do with better funding on that. Um, Okay, so there's a question, um, someone attending from California, it's not particularly related to transplantation, but um, someone who got immunoglobulin from healthy donors, which was prescribed for his UC and reversed his PSA. Have I ever heard of this? Uh, no. <laughs> and uh, certainly the, the, there's no evidence of it being helpful for PSC. Um, so someone talking about um, retransplantation. Um, so a number of our patients sometimes require um, a further 
transplant. Um, that might be, uh, I guess, in the context of PSC, not uncommonly because their PSC comes back. Um, it's controversial. I wouldn't say is it is it controversial. It's it's a difficult topic because there's no doubt having a second transplant is more risky than a first, a third is more risky than a second, and a fourth is particularly risky. And we are governed by um, our, by NHSBT to make sure people will have a reasonable outcome from a transplant. And that's because we only have a small number of livers we can use every year for all our patients. So you know, being straightforward, we do uh, ultimately rationed liver transplantation because we only have a small number of livers to offer. And that's why it gets difficult when people perhaps are on their, their third or fourth potential liver transplant is that we know that the outcomes once you get to that number aren't very good. And that's where the controversy lies is whether we should be doing, uh, for example, fourth liver transplants given that they're very poor outcomes. So I think that's the, the question around that. Um, so then there's a question around, I, I think really around um, being on the waiting list and how hard that can be. So I think it, it is very, very difficult, particularly ways being on the waiting list for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, I, I have no idea how people live with that, knowing that they need it, but knowing that it's not happening. Um, I think it can be very mentally tough, and that's why we're trying to put psychological support in um, uh, and try and help people as much as we can. We have a, a dedicated waiting list clinic here in Birmingham, and we try and look about, after our people with PSC as well within our service who are waiting, but I think it's a very, very hard time. It's, you know, I, I cannot hide away from that. Um, so the next question, Jenny's asking, what's the timeline from a hepatologist telling patients, I think we need a transplant assessment to going live on the waiting list? I guess I can only talk about our unit. Um, we try and make sure that once we've referred someone that they are having their first part of their assessment within 30 days and that they're going through that, that MDT discussion within another 30 days after that. So we'd like to try and get people ideally through and onto the list uh, within about a month and a half from that point of needing a transplant assessment from us referring them in. Um, obviously, sometimes it's longer than that for, for various reasons, but that's what we aim for. So rolling down. So, this is a question about live donation. Um, now, um, some of you may not be aware, but you can actually donate part of your liver uh, to someone else. Obviously you can't donate the whole liver, but you can donate part of your liver to someone else and that's called living donation. I'm just gonna put a light on. <laughs> Um, now, living donation is very common in some parts of the world. It's particularly common in South Korea because it's not uh, culturally acceptable for them to receive organs from people who've died. So all transplants there are from uh, living donation. It's very common in India and other parts of the world, but it's never really hugely taken off in the UK, apart from in the context of adults donating to children. Um, why might that be? I think partly because we've had a pretty good deceased donation program. Um, and, you know, there's no doubt that donating part, half of your liver is, you know, it's a risky operation. But I think in the context of rising waiting lists in the UK, I think there's a greater push once again around live donation. So yes, I would encourage um, if, if, if people are, have got someone from their family who'd be willing to donate to bring up that question. And uh, I think over time, it will become an increasingly uh, common procedure uh, across the UK. Um, so 
Oh yeah, okay, we're still getting in time. So someone's saying that they can hear us, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so I think um, moving on, um, what, so this is about prognosis, life expectancy, patients post-transplant. So just, I guess, to add to that, I think I answered that earlier. Um, uh, you know, I think, I, as I say, our greatest concern is, is around the PSC coming back, and we, and we know the risk factors for that. We know that, that people who've had their colon removed are much less likely to get current PSC, um, and, and therefore there does seem to be that the fact that the UC is playing a role in that. Um, if you have a living donor option, can you speed up the process and what are the risks? So I guess, yes, if, if you have someone who is willing to donate and your team is willing to do the procedure, then that will happen when it happens and you're not having to wait, um, particularly for, you're not having to wait for donation, et cetera. Um, the risks, are, you know, the, the main risk is around um, the donor um, uh, uh, and the risk of them going through an operation to taking out uh, a lobe of their liver. So, yes, yeah, so contraindications for transplant, including cancer. Would liver cancer or global bladder cancer preclude a transplant? So that's a really, that's a really good question. So um, currently, um, paticellular carcinoma, um, is, is actually an indication for transplantation as long as it's within certain criteria. Uh, so, in, so, you know, it's the, the, the tumour needs to be of a certain size uh, or if there are multiple tumours, they need to be of a certain size and they need to have not spread outside the liver. Um, if there was a gallbladder cancer, that, that would preclude a transplant. If there was a cholangiocarcinoma, well, we now have a new service evaluation coming online um, in, in the UK where cholangiocarcinomas that have been found uh, within the liver, um, um, if, they're, if they're caught nice, if they're caught early, might become, uh, there might be an indication. And also hyla cholangiocarcinomas, hopefully in the future, might become an indication uh, in transplantation. But, but generally, it, it, I guess what I was more mentioning about the contraindication for cancer is if that's if that's outside the liver at all, that, that, that generally is a, a, a contraindication. Um, so the next one, if whilst listed on the transplant list and you are getting recurrent episodes of cholangitis, but on antibiotics, do I need to notify my consultant if, if when antibiotics? Can, yes, so, so I think this is, this is a question about if you're living on the list and you're getting lots of episodes of cholangitis, uh, you know, do, uh, and, and you're needing stronger doses, do you need to let your team know? Now, I think it's always a good idea to let your team know about what's going on, even if that might be via perhaps the, 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 the consultant secretary, because they, they would always rather know what's happening. So the next one is about immunosuppression. Um, uh, what do you need to take and what are the main side effects? So immunosuppression after transplantation, um, we, we, we tend to use for the first three months, three immunosuppressive drugs. So we use steroids for the first three months. Um, that'll, generally that's in the form of prednisolone and we gradually reduce that dose and get rid of it by three months. We then use two other drugs. So the two mainstays uh, would be tacrolimus. So tacrolimus is an immunosuppressant known as a calcineurin inhibitor. Uh, that's the real mainstay of preventing rejection. We know it's very good at preventing rejection. And then we either use azathioprine or mercophenolate as a second agent. Um, and sometimes we get rid of that second agent at a year and leave people just on one agent. Uh, that, that decision depends on if you've had episodes of rejection uh, and so if you're having side effects from your What are the main impact side effects of these medications? So if we start off with tacrolimus, tacrolimus um, has a number of side effects. Uh, it can cause um, kidney issues, um, 
It, it, it tends to reduce the blood supply to kidney and cause poor, poor kidney function. It can cause tremors, headaches, neurological problems, it seizures even in some people. Um, uh, azathioprine and, and microbiome. So azathioprine uh, can cause side effects uh, um, and uh, as can mycophenolate. Uh, common ones with mycophenolate are often GI side effects, sort of stomach aches, diarrhea, prednisolone can cause um, high sugars, weight gain. Um, now, the other overall generic side effects of being on immunosuppressives are that they obviously reduce your ability to fight infection. And if you're on them for a very, very long time, they do increase your risk of developing uh, cancer over, over time. But of course, you have to take these drugs to prevent the, the, the liver from rejecting. And, and the balance that we try and uh, find over time is to have you on as little as possible so you don't have rejection and so you don't have the side effects that I was described. And we, we usually try and we usually manage to get to that point. So uh, I, this, is, this one's a bit specific, but, uh, but I, I guess on a more generic point of view, um, it's mentioning about vaccination whilst you're on the list. Um, we try and vaccinate uh, patients against hepatitis A and hepatitis B whilst they're waiting. Sometimes it's not successful. I mean, if you're particularly sick with your liver disease, uh, you, might, you might not mount a, 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 an ideal response. Um, certainly if that doesn't happen, it won't delay a transplant. Um, okay, so we're at 7.14, so sorry, I'm going on the questions. <laughs> so, it's great there are so many questions. So um, this is about going on holiday, I think, whilst you're on um, uh, the transplant wait list. So we would only um, suspend people who are leaving the UK because we can get people from anywhere around the UK. So you've gone a UK holiday, that's not a big deal. But obviously, if you go abroad, we can't be bringing you back uh, for a transplant while that's happening. So we tend to suspend people on the list whilst they're away. That doesn't have an effect on, on their chances of transplant apart from that episode. Obviously, you can't be transplanted whilst you're away, um, but it doesn't have an, uh, an effect on wait time at all. Next one, are living donor transplants a possibility for BSE patients? Yes, very much so, yep. But it depends, not all centres are doing them. However, if a centre isn't doing them, you can easily be referred to a centre that is doing them, if that's something that you wanted. Um, this is about how long um, you might wait um, for a transplant. I think I mentioned before about the uh, national allocation system um, and depending on where you live in the world, there are, there are different allocation systems, but generally they, they generally um, are based on need. In the UK, it's based on benefit, which is, 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 that, is that balance. Um, so how long you might wait depends on how sick you are. So if you're very, very sick, you should receive your transplant more quickly. Whereas if you've gone on quite early, you may wait a long time. Um, I know there's other factors such as your blood groups. Certain blood groups get transplanted more quickly, your size. Um, so there, there, there are a multitude of factors along how, how you might wait. Next question. Um, so this is a question around better results with deceased donors and living donors. I must admit in the UK, we don't have a huge amount of experience with living donors. And um, so I can't really answer that one. Typically at any point, how many people are on a waiting list? Okay, so um, within the UK, I think at the moment, this is probably a few weeks ago, I think we have kind of seven to 800 people awaiting liver transplantation. And that's climbed a lot. So before COVID, it was more like 400 to 500. So there's been a big jump in the number of people waiting transplantation. And that's probably twofold. One, obviously, we weren't transplanting as many people during the COVID pandemic because intensive care units were being used for other things. Uh, and also, um, we, we've seen a drop in donation um, also during COVID and after. Donation. It hasn't come back to its... its, its uh, it's, it's numbers that it was pre-pandemic. I'm sure it will, 
but as with many other things, things haven't gone completely back to normal yet. So that's how many people are on, a, on the UK waiting list. And that's different in different centres because different centres are larger than others. Um, but it, with it being a UK system, that doesn't matter. Um, so I think Julian's asked the question about PSC returning after transplants. As I mentioned, it does, sadly. Um, the kind of numbers are at five years, about 20% of people it can return. Uh, and, 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 and risk factors, as I mentioned, seems to be the, the coexistence of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, Annie has asked, are there any ways in the algorithm does not favour some patients, limitations of the algorithm, or how are they being addressed? Okay, yeah, great question. So, so it is an algorithm, it's a, it's a construct, and so there are definitely limitations. Um, one of the big limitations I feel is that the follow-up date is only, only, I think, five years that it's based on. And of course, we hope for much better outcomes than five years. You know, as I was saying, you know, I know lots of patients who've, who've, who are 30 years post-transplant. Um, and so all the time we're feeding back, there is a specific group that looks at the national allocation scheme. And we're constantly feeding back where we feel that there are, if there are certain groups who don't seem to be getting any access they should, and what they are what they are constantly doing is reviewing the algorithm, looking at outcomes, and looking whether all groups get equal access. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is a question. I, I won't sort of go too much in the specifics, but um, so so how do you? I think this is all about making a diagnosis of PSC. So it's sort of slightly different to the, the topic we're discussing, but yeah, making a diagnosis of PSC can be difficult. Uh, it's certainly not just made on blood tests. Uh, we often use a combination of uh, blood tests, imaging, usually uh, an MRI scan, an MRCP. Sometimes some people have had a liver biopsy. We use history uh, and we use all those tests together uh, and, and we look at the probability of making that diagnosis. So yeah, it, it can be a difficult diagnosis to make and that's why it's always good to see. I mean, you know, it, I've been put down as an expert, it just all, all that means is I see lots of people with PSC, not necessarily an expert, but you want to be seeing a doctor that sees lots of people with PSC. So they're, they're confident about making that diagnosis because it, it's important to get that right. Um, So I think we've talked about that, that question. So success rate at five years to be nine, how fast is the rate decline in the years going on? We, we in fact, we haven't got great long-term data on, on, on transplantation. That's probably something that needs to be written up a bit more. Um, but generally, you know, my experience is that if people, if people do, are doing well at five years, they tend to keep doing well. Um, obviously, there's there's a risk, and uh, and 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 you know, being on on immunosuppressive medications leads to the risk of infections and a greater risk of of, of, of cancer. But um, but you no, know, generally people do do well. Um, can hepatic encephalopathy be reversed or stabilized? Um, so we now do have treatments for um, hepatic encephalopathy. Um, you know that 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 the old-fashioned treatments are about keeping people's bowels moving regularly to to clear out the bowel to take toxins away. But we've got other treatments such as rifaximin uh, that can that can improve things. But ultimately, it's a worrying sign when someone gets encephalopathy, and it's a really significant sign of liver failure. And these treatments may improve the encephalopathy, but they won't improve the liver. And it's often a sign that you need to be thinking about. Uh, serious interventions such as transplantation. Um, so, when is a when is a liver deemed untransplantable due to portal hypertension? Uh, yeah, I don't. So normally that's not the case because portal hypertension is a sort of secondary effect of of liver disease and. Um, um, may, may be potentially more meaning if there's a blockage of the portal vein going in. That, that can sometimes be a problem with, with, with transplantation. If there's not 
uh, a vein to, to join the new liver onto, that can be uh, a problem. Uh, next question is around, can a family member offer to donate a portion of their liver to someone on the list? So, well, so you can, you can of course donate to a family member. There are uh, descriptions of what we call altruistic. So these are non-related people donating as well. Um, but that's much less common. So with PSCR bile ducts compromised, are the bile ducts from transplanted liver transplanted as well? Yes. So as you probably know, or may or you might not know, the majority of bile ducts are within the liver. So when you put in, it's not a new liver, it is a liver that's come from someone else. But when you put in that liver that has been donated, you're obviously getting all the bile ducts that are within that liver. What one thing that um, one thing that can be complicated is that there is obviously a bile duct coming out of the donor liver, and then the the patient who is receiving the organ there is still their bile duct. Now it used to be that we would always take that away and bring the bowel up to the donor bile duct uh, and um, create. Um, a what was called a Rouen Y biliary anastomosis. Um, and that's because we were always worried about disease in, in that bit of the bile duct, so PSC. But I think what we do now more often is if the bile duct looks okay in the patient with PSC, the surgeon will sometimes do a bile duct, bile duct join rather than that. So, so it, 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 I don't try to work, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I don't, I don't, I think things have changed. We used to always, always bring a bit of bowel up, but we're now more and more often doing a bowel duct to bowel duct anastomosis. Okay. Um, what are the difference between countries? I, I think that's probably asking around liver transplantation. So, um, so I think, as I say, in the UK, the majority of transplantation is, is after, um, uh, is around deceased donation. Um, there are, as I mentioned before, certain countries in the world, South Korea, where um, the, uh, the only type of donation is living related because they won't accept culturally uh, organs from people who've died. And then, of course, the majority of countries in the world, um, healthcare systems you pay for. So a lot of people will travel to other countries to obtain a transplant with, with their donor. That happens. Um, and so people will pay for a transplant if they have a, a donor and they have the money. Um, so that's how things will perhaps work in different countries. And there are different allocation systems in, in the countries all around the world. So different allocation system in the USA, to the UK, to France, to Germany. Um, how does a living donor transplant work if only part of the liver is transplanted? Oh, that's a great question. So well, the liver is an amazing thing, I would say that. So you can take... Um, only one lobe and that will be enough for a person and of course you all know that the liver can regenerate and so it will grow and and, and provide enough um enough uh, liver capacity for that for that person but obviously as part of the workup we need to make sure that when we are going to remove uh, a lobe of the liver that is going to be enough if you took a lobe from a very small person and tried to put that into a very big person that wouldn't be enough so we we of course work out the size uh, and, and that's going to be enough. How long does recovery take uh, from a liver transplant um, typically? Well, I think often people are feeling a lot better by three months. Um, I mean, people are sometimes home by seven days uh, and often feeling a lot better by three months. But, and it's a big but, I often say to my patients that you really aren't feeling truly better until often a year after a transplant. And, and, and why is that? It's all very well having the transplant and getting through that and getting better, but patients have often been ravaged by liver disease for a long time. And for their body to recover really takes a long time. And, it's, and as people have mentioned before, it's not just a physical recovery, there's the mental recovery. You've been unwell for such a long time, you've been through a hugely traumatic experience to mentally recover from all that. People often have quite a mental dip 
um, often after the three months or around six months because they have the high of going through the transplant. And then I think they understandably probably start dealing with all the trauma that they've been through. So I think mentally that can be a difficult time. So yeah, three months, a lot better, but often it's actually truly a year to getting back to where you should be. Um, do, I, do, do we have an understanding why PSC can occur? Trans well, sadly, we don't completely understand why PSC occurs. So why PSC reoccurs, I think, that, that thing I was mentioning about people who see, who've had their bowel removed um, seem to not get recurrent PSC to the same extent is a clue. Um, um, but, but why certain people do and certain people don't, I've seen lots of people who've got ulcer colitis and they get no recurrence. So um, we know that there are risk factors, um, but we don't know why completely it happens. Um, I think John has asked around the statistics likelihood of risk recurring. So I, I think I said that it's um, around 20% at five years. Um, so do, do we use prognostic models uh, to help patients uh, predict when liver transplant is expected to be necessary. Okay, so lots of UK. Yeah, so I personally don't. I, I, I think the trouble is models are great for research purposes and great for writing papers. <laughs> They've helped a lot of people get a lot of papers. But ultimately, you need to see someone with experience. Um, and, and as I said, the key is picking that right time for when to refer someone, you know, at the right time, nice and early, and noticing when things are starting to go downhill because they really can't, can be quite subtle. So no, I, I don't tend to, um, to, to use those models. What are the main health improvements you anticipate a patient, PSC patient would feel post-transplant? Well, I'd hope huge amounts of, of, of improvements. I mean, people with PSC uh, can feel absolutely terrible as, as, as many of you well, no, uh, with significant liver failure, itching, jaundice, lost muscle. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier in my talk, the reason I went into liver transplantation is I've never seen any other healthcare intervention help people in the way that liver transplantation does. I don't recognize some of my patients when they come to my clinic months after transplant, and it's just wonderful to see. So it, it can be truly transformative. Do I, do I think that artificially grown organs could appear in practice in this decade? Uh, probably not in this decade. Um, if I look back, it's always been talked about, but progress is very, very slow in that area. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't want to give false hope in that area. It's been talked about for a, a, a hugely long time. Out of people on the liver transplant waiting list, how many people have PSC? Um, I should know that, but I don't know that. And um, if I'm thinking about our centre, maybe sort of 10 to 15%, something like that. Um, I, I'm up, given that I run the PSC clinic, I obviously have slightly skewed in my mind, so I might be over thinking that, but I think that's about the right number. How many transplants can be done from the donation of one liver? Is it one donor, one transplant? Okay, good question. So uh, no, it's not necessarily one donor. So given, you know, we talked about living donation that you can take a lobe. Well, if you get a liver, you can also separate up the two lobes and donate the small lobe to a child and the larger lobe to an adult. And that happens quite often actually and that's a, obviously a hugely positive thing that one organ can help save the life of a child and an adult it's called a split liver transplant and and we do that uh, quite commonly it infers a slightly greater risk to the adults because of course you've you've had to do surgery on the liver and there's more risk of, of, of post-operative complications but most adults are okay with that because they know that by making that decision that the life of a child is being saved as well. Um, so 
if you have a low um, meld or you killed, how might you how might you wait? Um, so, I, so for those who don't know, MELD and UKELD are scoring systems for how advanced your liver disease is. So as I say, generally, this way the system works is it should be transplanting people, the sickest patients first. And that's why sick patients really shouldn't be waiting a very long time. And other people who haven't got such advanced liberties might be waiting longer. You can wait a significant length of time, two years. We even had people waiting three years. Uh, and sadly, what happens sometimes is people's liberties gets worse and then they get transplanted off the waiting list. Um, so this is someone talking about that they got azathioprine for ulcerative colitis and it stopped working. Would it work for transplanting you? So if you got azathioprine for ulcerative colitis, we'd be using it for a different reason after transplantation. And so... I, I wouldn't be concerned if it had stopped working for once you see. Um, so here's another, here's in a question around um, growing a liver, stem cells. Yeah, um, that was all, yeah, the rage number about, about 10, 12 years ago and, and really hasn't come to anything as yet. Obviously we remain helpful, but I, yeah, I, I, nothing that I've seen as yet that shows that we're any, anywhere close. Um, have I seen cases where it turned out that the patient had a different diagnosis? Yep, that's happened over time. So, you know, as doctors, we've thought um, we've thought that a patient has a diagnosis, and then when the liver itself comes out, we every liver that comes out gets examined very carefully by histopathologists, um, and we look. And sometimes the, the the diagnosis is wrong. Thankfully, that's not common, but it, but it does happen. If I was having a liver transplant, would I open, op, op, opt for a, I think you're talking a DBD or a DCD donor? Well, I think if I was incredibly sick, I would, I would opt for both. Um, a, a DBD is in general uh, a better donor, but there are also good DBDs and bad DBDs and good DCDs and bad DCDs. Ultimately, it depends on need, and we would always hope that we'd only use the organ that is suitable for that patient. Um, so James, if we take two more questions, and I'm so sorry I can't help you because I can't read the questions. No, on no, my it's, phone, fine. But... it's fine. It's <laughs> fine. I think we might be getting to the last question actually. Oh, okay. But, um, okay. Uh, these are great questions. Um, obviously, very educated webinar. <laughs> PSC patients tend to be educated yeah, yeah, on, no, on I agree. PSC. I agree. It's fun. It makes my life a lot easier. Uh, if you have a UKL score of 49, but no, de no features decompensation, is that an indication of transplant? Well, that's a really good question. So the reason, so th there is a minimum indication for transplantation that was brought in called a UKL score of 49. And why was that brought in? It's a concern that people were being put on the list and um, who their liver disease wasn't uh, the, the risk of dying from their liver disease wasn't as high as dying from a transplant. And so he, what, what the UKL score of 49 demonstrates is that your, that your risk of dying from your liver disease is enough uh, to go on a transplant waiting list. However, it's, in my mind, it's not an indication because you can have a UKL of 49 and your risk of dying from your liver disease is really not that significant. And in fact, we've got so much better at trans transplantation um, that the risk of dying from that is less. So as I say, you, yeah, it's a minimal listing criteria, but it doesn't mean that you should go on uh, to, to a transplant waiting list. So no, I mean, someone could have a UCAL of 49, 50, 51, and, and, and have no concerning features, and I would just watch them like a walking clinic. Yeah. And I think that's, I think, oh, oh, it was just a compliment. That's very nice of you, Tom. <laughs> so no more questions. Oh, well, Dr. Ferguson, thank you so much. And I do really apologize that my technology let me down this evening. And uh, thank you for asking the questions and for answering the questions as well. And we look forward to you for to joining us um, another time. 
Thank you to all of you who have joined the session this evening and for asking such great questions because they have been great questions. Um, the, NAS, the next RC expert session is specifically around PSC and vancomycin, which I know we always get a lot of questions about, right. and is with Dr. Nabil Qureshi on Wednesday, the 31st of May at 1 p.m. So it's a lunch hour uh, event, and we hope you can join us then. So, Dr. Ferguson, thank you so much for holding the fort while my laptop went down. <laughs> I really appreciate that, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. An absolute pleasure. It's been really nice and uh, great questions. Uh, yeah, really nice um, speaking with you all. Have a nice thank uh, you very nice much. evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.